If you have your Bibles, like I said, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. And uh, last week we started with a story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible because to me it shows the heart of Jesus. And it also shows me that people like me can have a second chance. It shows me that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how many times you've done it, God still loves you. And in Luke chapter 7, I'm going to read verses 44 through verse 50. Then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came to your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In this story, we find three people. We find a Pharisee who's named by the name of Simon. Now, a Pharisee in those days was a very religious man. As a matter of fact, I, when I think of a Pharisee today, I think of uh, there are Pharisees that I've met in church many times. These are people who are religious people. These are people who at attend church every time the doors are open. These are people who uh, may be deacons. They may be pastors. They may be elders in the church. These are people that also are very judgmental people. These people uh, may read the Bible every day. They may tithe. They may uh, uh, claim to know God. But there seems to be a judgmentalness about their whole attitude, right? I can remember as a kid being in church and just a child. And I remember one day a young girl walked in and I was sitting beside my grandmother and several other church ladies at that time. And I remember them snickering among themselves. And I remember asking my grandmother, why are they laughing at this young girl? What are they talking about? And, and grandma said, well, they're saying, why, she, why is she here? Because she's pregnant. And I remember thinking, even at that time as a child, what a judgmental attitude that they have. I mean, what better place for people who are sinners to be than church, right? Even as a kid, I knew that. But I've been through a lot of judgment myself. And I found that, you know, one of, the, one of the problems of coming out of the world is that you come out of the world, uh, you know, where you've been, you had all these friends that you drugged with, that you drank with, that you partied with. And you come out of the world and you seem to lose those friends, right? At least that's what you're supposed to because you've got to leave that behind. And then you come into the church and too often times in the church what you find is judgment. You find people who are condemning you because of your past, Right? I mean, isn't it, isn't it supposed to be that the world should know that we are disciples by our love one for another? That Jesus forgives the sinner. And Simon represented the religious establishment of his day. He had invited this young preacher, Jesus, to his home. And so Jesus and his disciples went into the home of Simon. And there was other guests that were there that were uh, a part of Simon's uh, group, I guess. They were also very religious people, I suppose. And as they were having dinner, after the dinner was done, I'm sure Simon was going to try to find out what Jesus was all about, what this young preacher who was about 30 years old, what he was all about, because he had heard rumors that this young man had raised people from the dead. So Simon's going to question him, I'm sure, about his doctrine and his theology, when suddenly everybody gets quiet, and they all look toward the door, and there's a woman standing in the doorway. Now, this woman is not named in the Bible. She's simply called a sinful woman. And even though she's not named, everybody in the room knew who she was. Everybody at least knew her by reputation. This woman was a prostitute. This woman was a slut, a whore. And everybody knew that. And, here, and they were sitting there wondering, why in the world is this woman at this house? Now, she scans the room and she looks across the room and she sees who she came to see. She sees Jesus. And she begins to walk across that room. And as I, I imagine as she walks across that room, uh, there are snickers. There are people who are judging her. There are people who are saying, why is she here? There are people who are questioning her. There are people who probably are hiding their heads because since being a prostitute, they had probably went over her house. You know how the hypocrites are. They judge others for what they do themselves in secret. And so she walks across that room and she comes to the feet of Jesus and she does something there that's almost astounding. The first thing is as she walks across the room, her eyes well up with tears and she begins to weep. 
And as she begins to weep, she falls at the feet of Jesus, who is now standing, I believe, because it says she knelt at his feet. And as she kneels at the feet of Jesus, she's crying so hard, she's sobbing so hard right now that the tears are literally dropping from her eyes onto the feet of Jesus. Now you can imagine this room full of men as they're watching Jesus with a prostitute. What's this young prophet, supposedly prophet, doing with a prostitute? Now she's, her tears are falling from her eyes onto the feet of Jesus and then she begins to almost apologetically wipe his feet with her hair. Dry the tears off his feet with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet. Wow. She has in her hand a, in her hands a jar of expensive perfume. Some think that she used this expensive perfume on her customers as a prostitute. But it's very expensive. And she begins to take this oil. She opens it up. The fragrance fills the room. And she begins to dip her hand in this oil. And she begins to massage the feet of Jesus. Now Simon is watching all this. And he leans back. And he thinks to himself. The Bible says this. This man is no prophet. This man is no man of God. Because if this man were a prophet. He would know what kind of woman this is touching him. And so, Jesus reads his thoughts. Now, I can imagine as the woman's kneeling there before Jesus and, and, and doing all this to his feet, I can imagine Jesus is now taking his hand and beginning to stroke her hair. And he reads Simon's thoughts and he says to Simon, he says, Simon, let me tell you something. And Simon says, okay, teacher, what do you got to say to me? And I'm sure Simon's waiting for an excuse, but instead, Jesus tells a parable. He says, Simon, suppose there were two men who owed a, a certain lender a lot of money or money. One man owed uh, a little amount, a small amount of money to the lender. The other owed a great amount of money to the lender. Now, the lender forgave both debts. He forgave the one who owed a small amount. And he forgave the one who owed a large amount. Now, Simon, which one of these debtors would love him more? Simon says, well, I'm sure that it's the one that he forgave the greatest debt. And then that's when Jesus says, you're right. You see, he who is forgiven little, loveth little. Now, who was that directed at? That was directed at Simon. You see, it wasn't that Simon did not need forgiving. It's that Simon never recognized his need to be forgiven. For some of you who say, I've always been a Christian, you're a liar. You've not always been a Christian. You see, because in order to become a Christian, you have to come to a point that you recognize that you are a sinner. You see, we like to think of ourselves as good people, yet the Bible tells us there's no one good, no, not one. There's no one who does good. There's no one that's righteous. And if you somehow think that you are better than somebody else, you're even further down the line than that person you're judging. Because all of us fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in this room. That's why there is no room for judging others ever. Ever. First of all, you've never walked in their shoes. My son and I was talking yesterday and he was like, Dad, I, I don't really like sports. And I said, well, that's because you never was exposed to sports, right? You see, if I'd have lived in your house and uh, the whole time you were growing up, because many of you know I went through a divorce and, and, I, and I only got to see him every other weekend. But if I'd have lived in that house, then maybe you would have been exposed to sports and maybe you would have, have liked sports better. And that's true. You see, what we're exposed to influences us, does it not? If you're exposed to uh, sex abuse or child abuse as a child, I'm sure you wouldn't be the good man you are today. You'd have a few more struggles, wouldn't you? If you were raised in a house where daddy wasn't home, trust me, you'd be different than where you, what you are today if you consider yourself a good man. You see, the very reason that we even claim any goodness at all is because somebody took the time to try to raise us right. Somebody took the time, put some time into us to try to help us to be right. You see, children on their own are not good people. You see, we are born in original sin. And somehow we think that, that children are taught how to be bad. Trust me, I'm an elementary school teacher. Kids are naturally bad <laughs> at times anyway, right? 
Surely you can be taught worse things. That's true. I don't disagree with that. The more you're exposed to, the worse you'll be. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says train up your child in the way he will go and when he is old he will not depart from it. You see what we're to do is we're to train the child to be good. We're to train the child to do the right things. We have to train a child to be unselfish. We have to train a child to have manners. Do we not? They don't come naturally to a child. You have to teach them how to do those things. Because inwardly we are naturally evil. Born in sin. Conceived in sin is what the Bible says. We got some kind of pop in there, but we're going to go on through this thing. And so what happens is, is that we, we are born evil. We are not good on our own. And what happens is we have to have somebody there to help us and to train us. So we cannot judge other people because we have not walked in their shoes. Now I have to ask the question, why is this woman doing this? Is she doing this because Jesus has says, your sins are forgiven, go in peace? And what a beautiful thing for Jesus to say. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. And that word peace means shalom. Have well-being. Be whole. Be, you're forgiven. But I don't think that she is forgiven at that moment. Because, see, the Bible indicates that she was forgiven earlier. Because Jesus makes the statement. He says that, uh, that basically that she's doing this because she loves me. So there's something that happened to this woman, I believe, a while back. Maybe she had heard Jesus teaching, and she discovered that he was in that home. But there was some place a while back that she realized that God still loved her, that she could have a second chance, that she could be forgiven. And so what happened was is that after that forgiveness, she went to see Jesus and to find Jesus because her love was shown to receive Jesus' forgiveness because of his forgiveness is the reason she went. It was not to gain his forgiveness, but because of the gratitude she had that she, it, that she had been forgiven. And so she risked embarrassment, she risked humiliation, and she came to Simon's house to, listen to this, worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. And there are several lessons that we need to learn real quickly about what it really means to worship Jesus. First of all, worship does not take place in a church building. Not just in a church building. Let me put it like that. Now today we call what we're doing today a worship service. But you have to understand that this building is not a church. You're the church. People are the church. And wherever you go, worship can take place. Worship can take place even as this woman did in the presence of her enemies. Everywhere you go, you are the church. And worship may suddenly erupt anywhere that ch the, the children of God are. You know, I was watching a video the other night of a worship service erupting in a Sam's Club. I was watching a video the other night also of a, of a worship service erupting in a parking lot. All of a sudden, people begin to praise Jesus. Have any of you seen those videos? where worship suddenly erupted because worship with a Christian can happen at any time. You see, one time Jesus met a sinful woman, another sinful woman at the well. She had been married five times and now she was shacking up with another guy. You see, prostitution is not just having sex for money. Sometimes prostitution is having sex for security, right? It's when women go from men to men and sell their bodies in order to get security because that's what it is, right? And so... This woman was basically a prostitute also. She was living with men for security. And she wanted to argue with Jesus about worship. She was saying, well, we worship here in Samaria on this mountain. And you guys worship in Jerusalem on that mountain. And Jesus says, look, I'm not here to debate worship with you. I'm going to tell you the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Wherever the spirit is, wherever the spirit goes, it's like the wind. You never know. But at any moment, worship should be breaking out among the children of God. I want you to also notice this. Worship is for sinners. It's not for people who have it all together. This woman is called the sinful woman. How would you like to be called the sinful man or the sinful woman? How would you like to be known as that? But it's only when we recognize that we are sinners that we can truly worship God. Listen to me. Only sinners can worship God. Because worship is when you realize that what you're worshiping is greater, is more powerful, is more magnificent than you are. Do you get that? 
So only those who humble themselves can worship God. Greater, people, uh, God is greater than we are, more powerful than we are, for he alone is worthy of our worship. Worthy is the lamb. His name is wonderful, and there's only one name under heaven by which people can be saved. And so sinners worship Jesus. The second thing we need to know is that worship takes place at the feet of Jesus. Our proper position of worship should be spiritually at the feet of Jesus. We should humble ourselves at his feet. You see, with humility and gratitude, we fall at the feet of Jesus and we cry, holy, 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 I'm a sinner in your sight, yet God, you have loved me despite myself. For while I was yet a sinner, Jesus chose to go to the cross and die for me. I was lost. I was dying. I was hell bound. I was beyond hope. But he loved me in spite of myself and sought to redeem me, and found something redeeming in me. And because of that, I fall at his feet spiritually, and I worship who he is because of what he's done for me, not for what he will do for me. Worship is also the preoccupation of the person of Jesus. I can't imagine what the others in that room was thinking when that woman walked across that floor and went to the feet of Jesus. But she was not there for them, was she? She was there for Jesus. And when we worship Jesus, we don't have to worry about who else is around us. We don't have to worry what other people might think or what other people might say. We worship Jesus because we are in love with Jesus. And that's the reason we worship. It's only Jesus that we worship. A true worship leader, and I've seen them, and you've been in services where you see somebody leading in a worship service. And what I found is a true worship leader is not one who simply leads in worship, but one who worships themselves. And as they worship, it's contagious among children of God. Because once a person starts worshiping, if you are a child of God, you cannot help but join in. Worship restores hope. It lifts spirits. It humbles ourselves. To worship is to drink from living water. It's to once again place our faith and trust in the only one who is truly worthy of our faith and our trust. Worship is more than, than trying to get something from Jesus. It's giving to God, to give him all of us. The, body, the Bible says that we are to make our bodies a living sacrifice, an act of worship. We should worship Jesus with our bodies. Worship is giving to God. It's giving him all of our sin. It's trying to make him Lord and master and ruler of our lives. It is trying to come into his presence. It's to bring ourselves to him and to come into his presence. Because let me say this. If you want the power of God, then you've got to find the presence of God. You can't have the power without his presence. And what worship does is worshiping Jesus ushers us into his presence. The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. What's that scripture saying? It's saying, enter into the presence of God and real spiritual, truthful, honest worship ushers us into the presence of Jesus. Where we cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Worship is also emotional. Sometimes, you know, I've heard people say that always you're, Preaching is too emotional or, you know, we don't want to get too emotional in church. Man, that woman wept. And I do believe that worship is an emotional experience. Because the same part of your soul that houses your spirit houses your emotion. You know what we need? We need in our church more joy. We need in our church more tears. Worship doesn't always take place with music or words. Sometimes it's simply desiring and abiding in his presence. Have you ever been in a real worship service? Are you really worshiped to yourself? That you truly humbled yourself and just, just stood in the presence of God and felt the presence of God? And as you felt the presence of God, sometimes you didn't say a word. You just abide. You just stand still. And you just let his love flow and wash over you. If you've never experienced that, you can. But you've got to worship him. You've got to worship him. You see, sometimes we may worship through our tears, other times through simply remaining still and letting God say, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Now go live in peace 
and shalom, just desiring to be in his presence and abiding in his presence, what's stopping you today from enjoying God? What's stopping you today from true worship? Is it because you're afraid of what others may think? Is it because you're afraid of what others may say? Are you afraid of getting too emotional? Are you afraid of looking at yourself in a spiritual mirror and seeing who you are? What's stopping you today from worshiping God? Do you not feel like you're worthy? Only sinners worship God. Today, Daniel's going to lead us in worship. I ask you to worship Jesus, fall at his spiritual feet, and honor and worship him. Today we will worship in song, but even more so, I hope you will worship in spirit and truth. God loves you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. And today he offers you a second chance. But you cannot truly worship Jesus until you realize what he's done for you. And I'm going to end by saying this. Jesus went to the cross for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you know that secret that you've tried to keep that you hope nobody would find out about? Oh, you've done some bad things, right? And you, some of those things you would say, you would confess, you would tell me probably. But there are other things that you've kept really secret because there's a lot of shame with those things. You remember that, 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 that you've done that you wouldn't want the church to know or maybe your mom or dad to know or your family to know or maybe even your husband or wife to know? You're so ashamed of that. You hope to carry that to the grave. Guess what? Jesus saw that. He was right there in the room. He saw exactly what you did. And where some churches and some preachers may get up there and say, you see, Jesus saw what you did. That's why you're going to hell. What I'm going to tell you is when Jesus saw that, he loved you. When Jesus saw that, he loved you in spite of yourself because Jesus knows why you do what you do. Jesus knows you were born in a sin-filled world. Jesus knows where you've been. Jesus knows what you've gone through. He's been there every day of your life. And so when he saw that, what he did was he chose, even though you were a sinner, even though uh, you've done all these things, Jesus went to the cross, man. He, he, he bore that cross up the hill called Calvary, and he laid down. Not that they forced him down, he chose to die. The Bible says he could have called down 10,000 angels. Instead, he put his hands down on that cross beam, and he allowed that Roman soldier to drive that nail through his hands and through his feet, to put that crown of thorns on his head, to lift him up naked for a world to see who laughed and mocked and ridiculed him. He could have come down from that cross but he stayed on that cross. Why? Because God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. What a beautiful story. And guess what? That us is you buddy. That us is you. That us is you. And if you were the only person to ever come to Jesus he would have went to the cross for you, just for you, just for you. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me for just a moment. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, today, I want every one of us in this room to worship Jesus this morning, but in order to worship him, we first of all have to recognize who he is and what he's done. And so I'm going to invite you today to invite Christ into your heart, into your life, to nail it down, to make sure that you are a child of God. And I'm going to do that by just asking you to repeat a simple prayer with me. You see, it's not the words that saves you, it's the meaning. Do you really mean it with all your heart? And if you mean this prayer with all your heart, you can know that you know that Jesus died for you today. You can know that you know that Jesus loves you today. And you can know that you are saved today and that you're going to heaven. Even though you are a sinner, you're going because of what Jesus did for you. He paid it all and all to him I owe. Pray this prayer with me. And I'm going to ask everyone in this room to pray this prayer aloud to help to pray along with you, okay? As we invite Jesus into our heart and lives. Dear God, Lord, I'm a sinner. I am wrong and I've done wrong. Jesus, you loved me. And you died for me. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I believe you were raised from the dead. I believe you are my Lord. I trust you with my life. Thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time today and you invited Christ into your life, then you can worship Jesus. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, to worship him in just a moment. I'm going to let Daniel sing just a, a quick invitation song. And it's time. I'm going to ask you to step out like that sinful lady did. And I'm going to ask you to walk across the room. I'm going to ask you to come out in front of everybody like she did, risking humiliation, not worrying about what other people think or what other people say. And I'm going to ask you to come up here and just simply grab my hand and say, Brother Wade, I prayed that prayer with you, and I embodied Christ in my heart and life. All I'm going to do is pray with you. That's all I'm going to do and send you back to your seat. But we're going to have just a quick invitation, and during this time, I want you to step out right now, and you come. I was blinded, you gave me eyes to see. I was going under, you reached out to me. No, there's nothing you won't do to pick me up. Every hour, eight days a week, yeah Somebody in this place, come on now.